All right, so at this point, we should start to see the tip of the iceberg of what we're in for. We have the ability now to create a multi-platform project based on the, the, the same codes that we've learned before, the same code base of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, obviously, we're itching to do this on our own computers at home. Um, and you will be able to do this on a Windows or Mac computer. So I have I've put some handouts now in the network folder. Let's go back to the network folder. If you go back to the desktop, open computer, classroom data drive Z, and then scroll down to find Campus Android 2. I put in three items there. Copy all of these to your desktop or flash drive. The printer's not working at the moment, but you want to copy Campus 1A, 1B, and 2. We're going to have probably around 7 or 10 handouts throughout the course. All of this stuff then, again, it's complicated, but I've got it all written step by step. I just tested it yesterday. I've tested it on a variety of computers throughout the years. So this stuff works. The big failure point, unfortunately, bluntly, is you. Your particular computer, with your particular RAM, with your particular... Uh, device is the problem because the hardware the software I've tested it on a variety of computers Windows 7 Windows 8 Windows 10 Mac OS 10 point whatever I just tested it yesterday on an old 2005 laptop running Windows 10 and it worked so this stuff works it's just this is a lot of failure points I hopefully have covered all possibilities um, I just wrote handout 1B yesterday because this is the latest failure point here. But anyway, get a copy of all three of these and we'll look at these because the software is all ready to go on our computers. <coughs> on your home computer, it's not. You need a lot of setup. So I've got them all numbered 1A or B and then 2 and 3 and 4, etc. Let's look at Campus 1A first. The way all of this works is by using so something called Node.js. How many of you have heard of Node.js before? Okay, if you've done web development, you've heard of it. If not, Node.js is a runtime environment that lets us create a variety of projects. With Node.js, I can create web projects, Android projects, iPhone projects, etc. We will use Cordova, also known as PhoneGap, to take our humble website project and evolve them into full-featured cross-platform device projects. Taco, which is tools for Apache Cordova, is software that smooths out the rough edges of Cordova by helping us quickly set up all the myriad software. When I was teaching this class a few years ago, we needed to download Node, we needed to download Java, we needed to download Ant, we needed to download the Android software, like four or five separate downloads. All of those downloads basically now come in one package, Taco. We're able to automate all of that setup a lot faster with Taco. To get Taco, we need Node. You don't have to do this, it's done on our computers. But at home, you would go to nodejs.org. It would recognize if you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux, and recommend a version. You want the one that says LTS. I think it's it's got either version 4 or version 6. 6 is the newest, hottest, cutting-edge one, which might, might not be what you want when you're developing an app. You want something stable. LTS is the long-term... What is it? Long-term support. Long-term support. So this version of 4.6 is the one you want that is the most bug-free and stable. Again, at home. This is already set up here. At home, you would download Node, you would install it, leave all the defaults as is. It's going to install a brand new software on your start menu called Node and Node Command Prompt. Again, you don't need to worry about that at the moment. You would do that at home. So step one at home, install Node. Step two, Cordova is a framework that lets us write code we're familiar with, HTML, CSS, JavaScript and translate the code to Android or iOS, Windows Phone, Mac, whatever. It is what allows us to upgrade a simple web app into something that can access the features of the device. 
and be distributed in app stores. You're not going to upload your website to Google Play. You're not going to upload your website to Apple App Store. You're going to upload a real app. In Android's case, an APK file. In uh, iPhone, an IPA file. In Windows, I think it's an XAP file. You're going to upload a file that has been compiled, not a website. Taco helps us do that. Cordova helps us do that. Modern Cordova requires a bit of command line interface work, which is this, typing in a couple of commands. That's the command prompt, the command line interface, the CLI, the CLI. We will use TACO, tools for Apache Cordova, that make the initial process easier than ever before. Again, I've taught this three years. I, this is one of the easiest ways I've seen. It's already done for us. We don't have to do this. But what you would do after installing Node, you would start, you would activate the Node command prompt. Uh, our variation here of the plain old command prompt is the same thing. But at home, you would type npm space install gtaco cli. You would be installing the taco software in your Node command prompt. It's done for us here. Don't do it. It's already done. But what we can do, if you still have the command prompt open, you can type taco space dash v. This says what's the version of my taco. We have mine says one two one. Does everyone have one two one? If you did it, if you didn't do it, that's okay. If you have one two zero or one two two or whatever, it doesn't matter. But we've got taco installed on these computers. At home, you don't. That's why you follow my handout. If it asks you about helping to improve the quality, etc., you may choose yes or no, doesn't matter. There's another process here of creating a template file. Um, we'll follow these steps a, a little bit again in just a moment. Um, let's see this. We're going to skip around a little bit because it's already done for us. but. At home, then, once you've installed Taco, you would open command prompt and you would type cd desktop. cd, as we'll see, is change directory. You're changing from one folder into another folder. cd desktop. We've done that. We were on the desktop. We did Taco create the name of some folder for our project. We typed Taco create my app, and therefore it made a folder called my app. In the example here, I'm saying, if you want to test this at home, ta uh, taco create test 01. We would create a brand new folder to kind of test this out a little bit to see if it's working at home. We didn't do this uh, today, and we will do it a little later when it matters, but we would then add another parameter here two more parameters. Question? Yes, all of this will also work on a Mac. On a Mac, you open up your terminal on the Mac, type all of this, and it's the same thing. On a Mac, good, good thing you reminded me, oftentimes you'll have to type sudo at the beginning, S-U-D-O, uh, especially when you're going to do this install portion. I'll write that in my notes here. On a Mac, all of... On a Mac, all the commands work, but some need sudo. So you would type sudo npm install g taco cli. But some of this other stuff like uh, taco uh, emulate Android, that shouldn't require elevated privileges. Um, if it gives you the error that it can't do it, try again with type sudo first. Add sudo to a command on the Mac for admin access, if you get an error. How many of you are planning on trying this on a Mac at home? OK. so. If it doesn't work when you type the command that we did, try sudo first. It'll ask you for your password, and then it should let you change some of those 
administrative aspects. If you're going to do this on Linux, same thing most likely, sudo npm install and such. We didn't have to do it on our version of Windows, it's pretty uh, lax in security, so we can simply type npm install on your home computer. But when we were doing earlier um, taco create, we created a folder for a project that can be anything we want with spaces and capitals or whatever. We, we, we keep it lowercase simply to type it easier, because when we're in the command prompt, we're going to need to type the commands exactly. And if we type it incorrectly, it just won't work. And so I'm recommending lowercase at all times, just so that it's easier to type and retype. In the example number four here, taco create test one, and then we have something that looks like a website. Well, if you ever browse the App Store, if you're looking for, let's say, uh, a mileage tracking app, you're going to search that and you're going to get 50 results or 100 results of the same kind of app. And you may even get dozens of results with the exact same name, just a different icon. There's tons of calculators in the App Store. There's tons of, you know, flashlights in the App Store. There's a, there's a variety of the same app, maybe even with the same name. Well, the way they are differentiated in the App Store is a package ID, which is this. We didn't do this earlier. We didn't need to know that yet. A little later, when we start our app for real, we will then give it a unique package ID. There's only one package, there's only one app in the whole app store that is com.victor.calculator. But there's com.amazingapps.calculator. Or there's biz.victorapps.calculator. So that unique identifier differentiates your app from everyone else's, even if it's got the same name. We'll do this a little bit later. You don't have to have a website to do this. We're going to make it up. We can do com.yourlastname.the name of our project right here, which is the same name as the folder. If any of you were curious and you were in your device and you went over to the, uh, the apps, There's all the apps. Here's our app installed. It's called Hello Taco. We never specified the name of our app. So we just put the basic name, Hello Taco. When we are creating an app for real, we've got a spot to put a real name, which can be edited later. We'll see how. But when we're creating the app, we have the ability at that moment to also add a name, in quotes, with any spaces, capitalization, or symbols we want. And that, whatever we type there, will appear below the app icon. We'll be able to change it after the fact a little later. Question? Did we create our app from the list of the app store? They were all the same app, basically. It was there to enter your classes. Can we, can we create a different type of app? Yes, you can totally create whatever kind of app you want during the class. We will all be learning the same sort of project, just so that we're all learning the same thing. But on the side, you could be working on your version of an app as well as our version. Or you can have our app and then customize it at the end of the course, as we will do anyway. So either or. Work on your own, work on ours, or work on both. Um, so we'll do this again a little later. It mentions that if you do taco help at any point in your command prompt, it will pop up to remind you what are the, some of the possible um, taco commands. We can, of course, get them all from the taco website, but that's pages and pages of documentation. If you, if you simply type taco help, that'll run the taco software with the help command. You know, when we had taco platform add, I mean, uh, taco create, etc., that would have been like opening up the software and going to file, new, and then a new screen. Fill this in, next. Fill this in, next. Fill this in. That's the same as one command, if we know the command, enter, done. 
So if you are not used to or comfortable using the command prompt because there's no pretty icons to click, again, it's very fast if you know the right commands. Taco Help just tells you a little bit of info, some classic ASCII art, and then it tells you right here, Taco Create, Taco Kit, Taco Install, Taco Build, <coughs> Help, Docs, Feedback. So if I wanted deeper documentation, Taco Space Docs, or Taco Space Plugin, and so forth. We type taco create project, and then we had to go into the project to do the following commands. That's in the notes. We, went, we type cd to enter the folder. First we were on the desktop, we created the folder, then we do cd into the folder, taco platform add android, or taco platform add browser, like we did, or taco add ios, if we could, if we were on a on a Mac. This is one that we will definitely not do here, but you need to do it at home because it just worked for us because I set it all up. If we, if we had to do step six in class, we'd spend half an hour setting that up, and then every time we restarted the computer, we'd have to do it again because of deep freeze. So I've already done step six. I've already done all these steps. At home, you need to do it at least once, which is Taco install requirements for Android. It will connect to the mothership and say, you need this and this and this. You need to download 400 more megabytes. Let us take care of it. Press yes. And it'll do it. In the old days when I was teaching the class, we had to manually download all of these separate pieces of software and set it up. This will do it all behind the scenes. Taco install. If I had this on a Mac, taco install Rex iOS. <laughs> and it would install the required iOS stuff. It'll say, because we're working with Android, you need the Java development kit, you need the Android software development kit, and you need the Android SDK packages. It may be at about 400 megabytes or so. It'll download, it'll give you feedback that it's downloading and installing, it'll all be done. You will need to exit command prompt and open it again to see the latest changes. I, I say there, you type exit on command prompt, you load it up again, you cd to the proper folder, you change directory to the proper folder. A big failure point for beginners is you, you forget to go into your folder in the command prompt to do any of these commands. You have to be in a taco project folder for any of these taco commands to work, except for taco create, because you haven't created it yet. I've got a chunk on number seven, which will be easier for us to do in a moment. We're going to type taco plugin add. We have all of these plugins. These are, this, these are all of the ways that we are able to access all of the features of a device. If you look through all of the gibberish here, you will see camera, geolocation, device orientation, file transfer. We will be able to save stuff if we wanted to from our app into the SD memory card of the device. We will be able to pull something out of it. A uh, website can't do that. We will be able to check the battery status of the device so that it pops up and alerts you. You're at 10%. Don't forget to charge your phone we can check what's the orientation so that if we orient horizontally something else happens on screen it can check what's happening with the device these are plugins and via plugins we can install um, all of these other features such as a barcode scanner bluetooth access what else is cool nfc communication all of these things i was just playing with a barcode scanner plugin a little while ago and what I'm able to do with my web app is open up the barcode scanner, find a barcode and scan it, and then what do I do with the data is up to me, but I can scan a barcode in my app that I can program in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. If I wanted barcode ability on a classic Android app, I'd have to learn how to write that code in Java, and then relearn how to write that same code in Objective-C, and relearn how to write that same code in C-sharp for all the platforms. 
We just need to learn one version in JavaScript. Taco will take care of the rest when we do Taco Build, and it'll translate it to all the proper languages. Um, if you've got your command prompt open, let's try this. Taco space plugin space add space Cordova dash plugin dash camera. We're not going to install all 20 plugins to this quick little testing project at the moment, but this would be the code to give your app the ability to access the camera. <laughs> Press enter. It's going to connect back to the Cordova mothership. Find the software, download it. It says right there, installing it. Installing it for your Android. Installing it for your Android template and installing it for your browser template. So now my browser version of the project has the camera ability, and my Android version has the camera ability. So that's just a little snippet of what I've got here from my uh, number seven. Taco, plugin, add, and then some plugin. After that, let's type taco plugin, and it'll just confirm what, what uh, plugin, one word. It'll confirm what um, plugins have been installed. Remember to press enter. We've got the camera plugin installed and something called the whitelist. We never said anything about it, but there's something called whitelist. We'll talk about it later. We've got version 1.2 of the camera and 1.3 of the whitelist. Eventually, there will be a version 1.3 with more features. But all of this we can download and set up for free. Um, uh, Taco Build Android would prepare the project. We've seen how to do that. If a Windows firewall appears. So this is just saying what might happen if you're at home. It shouldn't happen on these computers. I've already set it up. But one thing that I'm starting to see, how many of you at home have a Windows 10 computer? Okay, here's something that I've started to see that goes wrong with Windows 10. You follow all of these steps, and then when you get to the point of taco build, you get a failure. Doing research, it seems that perhaps the version of Java that is installed is not the correct one. So guess what? I took last night, you know, at midnight to prepare all of this, I put together a handout for you if you're having this trouble. If you type taco build on Windows 10 and you get some weird error message, look around in the code and see if it says in the output unsupported major dot minor version 52. If you get that error, I may have a solution for you. If you get something else, we have to figure it out. But that possible error can be fixed with my other handout, Campus 1B, which I'm not going to go into detail with. You won't need it unless you get the problem. But over on Campus 1B, several steps here on how to possibly fix that error. Blah, 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 blah. Fix that. Let's say you fixed it then it should work. Taco build, taco emulate Android. Later on we will say taco deploy to a real device. But the big failure point that I'm starting to see with Windows 10 is the wrong version of Java. And that's a possible solution. Another failure point, right now when we did taco emulate Android, we already had an emulator ready on our computer. I've already set it up for us to get us to work. But at your home, if the emulator doesn't appear, guess what? Campos number two. And that number two, we'll look at that one in a moment. That's how to set up an Android virtual device. All of the code that we care to edit is inside of our project folder, www folder. Every other folder you don't really need to touch. We will look at the other folders. But the main Stuff that matters is in the www folder, and that's CSS, HTML, JavaScript. You can get more reading 
and more knowledge over at cordova.apache.org and taco.visualstudio.com, same as taco.tools. That's the big overview there. All of this is basically done for us in this lab. You don't need to do the setup. It's done. At home, you definitely do. You don't have the software. Any general questions on page one? Sheet one? Yes? No. You only need to set up node once. You only need to set up taco once. But every time, if you want to create a brand new project, you would want to do the create. the create taco create because it's a brand new project we will create for ourselves a template very soon so that we don't have to do the taco create taco add plugins taco build over and over we will have a template to get started with projects faster in the future because if you think about it our whole project is this if you copy this technically that's a whole new project with some fine-tuning we have to do. But any one of these taco projects is self-contained into a folder. You don't have to worry about refactoring and all that complicated stuff if you were in some other editing environment. This will make more sense later, but basically whatever taco project we create is self-contained. You can move it from flash drive to flash drive, computer to computer, and keep working on it. Right now, ours is only about 6 megabytes large, but then eventually it's you know going to get to 30 or 40 megabytes as we add more projects, more platforms, that is, and more code, 880, 808 files. So if I had the printer working, you could print that out, but maybe next time. So let's go look at handout number two. You can look at 1B at home if you need to fix that Java problem. We don't in this room, so we'll skip it. But let's go look at handout number two. Campus 2, set up AVD. Let's take a quick look at what this is telling us to do. It's already done for us, but let's see what it would look like for you at home. Um, when we did Taco install Rex, Android, it downloaded the Android code, the Android software development kit. It downloaded all of the, the code that we need to create Android apps. If you were going to make an iPhone app, you would do taco install rex iOS, and it would install the requirements for building iOS apps on a Mac. And so the SDK manager is what lets you know this is the version of Android code that you have on your computer there's a new version out download it or your current version is out of date plus extra stuff we don't need to make any of these changes on our computers but at home you will so just to show you what this looks like this is saying you need to open up computer let's give this a little try open up computer open up the C drive Open program files x86. Open Android. Open Android SDK for Windows. You've got, you've got the various pieces of the Android code here. So again, the Android operating system is open source. It was basically given out for everyone to be able to use. And so we can manage the Android code right here. We can manage virtual devices and the actual software. We want to right-click SDK Manager, run as administrator. You may get a quick flash for a moment, but just wait a little bit more. You should see eventually this. It's connecting back to google.com to check all of the software. The code here does not automatically update itself unless we choose to do so. That's good, because I recommend do not update your main software in the middle of a project. If I'm learning Cordova version 4, 
and they release Cordova version 5 next week. I'm not going to upgrade to version 5 yet until I'm done with my project. I don't know what code has changed, what code has been deleted, what code has been deprecated. And I may need to learn something new because version 4 is new and better than version 3 that I was using. So this for us is just informational in this room. At home, Again, even though it's telling you this is Android 25 and you've got 24, why don't you download 25? No, we're not going to upload, we're not going to update our code um, in the middle of a project. When you're done with a project and you're going to start new, or if you've released version 1 and then a few months later you're going to release version 2, maybe think about updating your software because new software gives you new features, fixes you know, security issues and such. But in the middle of a project, it's, you know, walking on eggshells. So mine is saying, okay, you've got the Android software. The current version installed is 25.16. 25.22 is available. That's nice. So we have all of these things installed. Android 7, we don't have that installed on our computers. It doesn't matter. We don't need the latest and the greatest. It just came out like two weeks ago. It's, it's still too cutting edge. Scrolling further, there's a section of Android 5. That's the version we've got installed. That's fine. So we have all of this cool stuff here about uh, emulators. We have uh, we have right, right here the basic the basic system image emulator. We could download the Android TV emulator so we can have like a mini TV in our computer to act like a TV. We could have the Android Wear, so if you want to make apps for watches, we can download an emulator for watches. We don't need it in this class, but it's all there. We have versions of Android all the way back to 2.1. So we have all of these different versions of Android that we can work with, 7 down to 2. Android can be defined by the larger family name 2x, 3x, 4x, up to 7x. It can also be defined by the API, which is just an incrementing number. The API version 7, 11, 18, 24, that's the latest version. And Android can also be defined by a cute code name, which is based on a candy treat, which is alphabetical. Um, it goes from like Android Donut, Eclair, Froyo, Gingerbread, Honeycomb, etc. Yes, I can name them all, but. They're all code names. The latest one we saw on the website, Nougat. Android 7, Android N is Nougat. The last version was Android M. Anyone know what M was? Marshmallow. Before that was L, Lollipop. Eventually there will be Android O. What's a, what's a candy treat that starts with O? Oreo. Maybe it'll be Android Oreo. We did have Android KitKat when we were on K. I wonder what candy it'll be when we get to X. Something with xylitol, maybe. <clears throat> but uh, this for us is informational. We don't need to do anything in this screen. At home, my handout says, you want to turn off all the check marks and only turn on these check marks that I'm saying here. You don't have to do it in class, it's done. At home, you turn those on, you accept the license, you click Install, and you will get the version of the software that we need for this class. One of the extra things that we should install is down here under Extras, the Intel Emulator Accelerator, Hexum. If you're going to run a virtual device, like we've got running right here, the accelerator is very useful because we're running a mini computer in your computer. If you don't install this accelerator, that emulator will run very slow. You click and you're going to see the animation frame by frame by frame by frame opening. 
if you're not going to use virtual devices, it doesn't matter. If you're going to use a real device, that doesn't matter. You're going to use a real device. But that accelerator is very useful. And emulators are still useful because I want to test my app on my real device, 5 inch device. But what does it look like on a 7 inch tablet? And let's say I don't own a 7 inch tablet. I can create a 7 inch tablet emulator to test how it would behave on there, how it would look like. I can test it on you know, an Android Wear device. I don't have an Android watch, but I can create an Android watch emulator to kind of see what my app looks like. And if I have this accelerator, it'll work a lot better. So that's what you do at home. You don't do anything here. Any questions on the SDK manager? I'm going to close that. We don't need to do anything. We'll look at this here. Set up an Android virtual device. If you don't have a real device, you can run virtual devices that emulate the experience. Let's actually do this one. This is one's very useful. Even though we already have one in this class, we'll create another device just to see what it looks like. My handout says, okay, inside of that folder, it's the same folder as the SDK manager, C drive, program files, x86, Android, Android SDK windows. You're going to see the AVD manager. I want to right click the AVD manager and select run as administrator. You may get a flash of a command prompt for a moment, keep waiting, then eventually you get this pop-up. And in this room I've already set up a Nexus 5 running API 22, which is Android 5.1, with an Intel Atom CPU. We have these device definitions, these templates. You can create an Android TV emulator, an Android Wear round chin emulator. We have all of these types of devices, a Galaxy Nexus. The stats are it's a 4.7 inch device. I scroll around a little bit more. A Nexus 6 is a 6 inch device and so forth. But notice all of these have some RAM requirement. This is RAM that is going to be borrowed from your main computer. So if I've got a computer with 4 gigabytes of RAM and I want to create a Nexus 5 device, it's going to suck up 2 gigabytes for itself which means you're going to have 2 gigabytes left for Windows and everything else. Some of these other devices are a little bit more conservative. Here is 343 megabytes of RAM. So there's all of these different kinds of devices with different requirements. And monitor sizes and screen sizes. Just to follow my handout to kind of test this out, let's scroll down to find the generic no-name 3.2 inch QVGA ADP2. This is a generic 3.5 inch Android device that you are not going to find anywhere in the stores anymore. But I like to recommend you to set this one up at home because this is a pretty low powered device. If your computer cannot handle this low powered device, it's not going to be able to handle an HD quality 55 inch screen on your, on your computer. So whatever one of these are, you can play with them later. But we're going to try this one. We're going to try the 3.2-inch QVGA. My handout says on the right click, Create AVD. Get this window here. We can name our device whatever we want. I'm going to leave the name alone. You can change it if you want. The device is one of from the template. Leave that alone target. In this room there's a little bug here for some reason at home it shouldn't bother you here but at home but but here it's saying okay our target is Android 5.1 but we can't select the CPU so switch your target only in this room to Google API and then it'll say okay we'll use the Google CPU at home if you followed my instructions it should automatically be set to the Android 
template and the Intel CPU. Again, I just double checked my handouts last night, so they should work. But in this room, make a note if you're going to create a virtual device, target Google API, CPU, Google API. Keyboard, hardware, keyboard present. If you turn this one on, you will be able to type on the keyboard in the device instead of clicking A, B, C. You'll be able to use a real keyboard on a virtual device. Skin. We can have a sort of different template for that emulator like we saw earlier. We have a few different emulators here, but we'll just use the basic one, skin with dynamic hardware controls. It's a very basic skin. This old device didn't have a front-facing camera. Back-facing is this one up here, of course. Front-facing is this one. This old template doesn't have a front-facing, so we cannot select it. But we can activate a back camera. If you're running this on your laptop at home, most likely you have a web camera. Therefore, your emulator can use your web camera. You can test a real camera on your laptop in the device. We don't have web cameras in, on these computers, so we can do none or emulate it. It'll pretend like it's a kind of a camera and you're going to see a little square running around and it's kind of a camera. Memory options, you can leave those alone. Those came from the template, they're fine. If you want it to run faster, more RAM perhaps. If your system is, if your laptop or desktop itself is a little bit low powered, you may want to decrease the RAM, but then the emulator will even run even slower because it needs its own hardware. Internal storage, this has a whopping 200 megabytes of storage. Don't worry about changing that, that's good enough, but you can put gigabytes, megabytes, whatever. What we do want to put in is an SD card to store a picture. So we can put any size we want here. I said in my hand I'll put 99 simply because it's easiest to type if your hand is already near the keyboard. Doesn't matter. They don't even sell 99 megabyte SD cards. They never did. But whatever, just some size of me memory card. Emulation options, snapshot, emulate state will be persist between emulator executions. That will just basically let you create snapshots of your project. We're gonna sort of like freeze our project at a certain point and then do some variations and freeze it there. Not really, we don't quite need this because of the, the nature of our project. It's gonna be plain old HTML, we don't need to make it very complex, so we will not use snapshot. My handout turn on use host GPU. This will give your emulator a little more kick because it's also going to tap into the graphics processor of your computer. We have the CPU of your computer, but if you've got a separate graphics card or other such um, hardware, the emulator will use two CPUs, the main one and the graphics one, which might speed up the emulator more. So again, we tested it on these, you know, middle-of-the-road computers that the school provides us. When you go home, unfortunately, many of you are going to be disappointed. You're going to follow all my steps exactly, and you're going to see maybe my computer with 4 gigabytes of RAM is not good enough. Maybe my Intel Pentium computer is not up to snuff. Maybe my Windows XP system is running a little slow. So I'm having us here create one of the most basic emulators as a test to see how well are you going to fare at home. If you're having trouble with this basic emulator, the whole process of developing apps on your own computer might be a little annoying. It might be time to ask Santa for a new computer. I'm going to say OK. Maybe it looks like nothing happens, just wait a moment, it's going to process, it may even say not responding, just wait a moment. It's building a little computer inside your computer. You get a pop-up that says you just created a device with all of these features. Let's click OK. And now on my device, virtual device manager here, I've got two 
devices, the 3.2 inch one I created and the Nexus 5 from before that I created for you. I still have my other device running around and I'm going to say that depending on your computer, depending how new your computer is, and depending how powerful the CPU and RAM is, you may be able to run more than one device at a time. But each one is taking up gigabytes of RAM and cycles of your CPU. I know on my computer here, because I'm already running my recorder and other things, uh, that's going to tax my system too much. I'm going to close my emulator that's already running. You can leave yours running. I think yours will handle it better because you don't have extra software running like me. But I've closed the other emulator that was previously running and freed up its RAM and resources. And I'm going to select the emulator we just created and click to start it. Start that emulator. And um, then there's some other options here. Don't worry about these just yet. Just click launch. It's going to pop up here. Process that. Eventually you will get a screen of a new emulator. Just keep waiting a moment. All of this stuff about an emulator, if you have a real device, you won't have to worry about it too much. You have a real device. But if you don't have a 7-inch tablet to test, this is a reason why you might want to use a virtual device. This is going to show up a little bit different than before, a little smaller. Wait for it to boot up, and then eventually you'll get a device. Is anyone having any trouble at this point? Okay, so yours may start up faster than mine, but the point of this is this is another uh, another device, another version of a device, and it doesn't have like the phone dialer and that sort of thing, but it has web browser, it has a camera, we can install apps to it. This is what you'll want to do at home. This is what my handout number two is saying. After the AVD launches, you can close your AVD manager, so once this is running, if you want to, you can close the, the manager to free up some resources, but once this starts to boot up, then you can close the manager if you want. Test the AVD by swiping through screens, browsing the web. Keep the AVD open as you complete your projects. You don't have to wait for a restart. Notice how long this boot up is taking. I would have to wait for it every time. If I closed it, it has to boot up every time. So as we work throughout the various days, I'm going to remind us as soon as we get into the room we're going to set up our devices so that they're waiting for us. Then we're going to get into our code and start editing our code and run our apps on our devices so that we don't, our devices that are waiting, so we don't have to keep waiting for the boot up every time. This booted up like a brand new device. Okay, I would tap got it. You know, this is a device. Web browser. This one doesn't have the buttons at the bottom like the other device, but it's got the home button on the right, back button, volume and power. So this is that hardware. I'm loading up Google right there. And I can do a Google search. And because we activated the option, I can use my keyboard. So I don't have to click the keyboard there. I can use my real keyboard of my real computer you know, to do a real Google search on this emulator. In this room, then, um, you see the nuances because we've already got it set up. 
at home, you will need to um, do, the, do, do this setup because you don't have any of this software at home yet. That's handout two. Any questions on handout two? Okay, so let's take one more break. You've got a few things to think about here, handouts one and two. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll uh, look a little bit more at what we've got here with Taco and so forth. Uh, and then we'll wrap up for the day. So it's uh, 8.22. We'll take a break until 8.32, and then we'll go on.